I've worn my fair share of Kevlar. So we are butchering some javelina today. And this is Stephen Forrest. How you guys doing? He's got his own hunting page or group, I'm sorry, that I'll introduce you guys to later. And uh, he's out here in Tucson with me. How long you been here in Tucson, Stephen? I was born basically in this house. Oh, wow. So how long was that? You're going to date me now, man? <laughs> On video. I just turned 50 uh, in January. Well, you look good for 50, man. So I've been busting ass and busting everything else, trying to make things work. Yeah. So basically we're taking the, the silver skin off any of this white stuff or any of the clear membrane because that's what makes any cut of meat tough. I don't care if it's javelina, deer, beef, uh, regular pig, it doesn't matter. This is what kills your teeth. Using one of Kevin's knives here, and I'm liking it so far. This is really nice. He's got the uh, modified MOD, the Mohawk of Death. There's a reason for that name, but we'll talk about it later. I mean, I can get right underneath here, and I can start peeling some of this off real easy. This javelina has been aging in a cooler for, oh, I want to say... 10, 11 days now. Typically, I age javelina in a refrigerator, which could be a controlled environment. But unfortunately, the compressor went out on it, so I have to do it this way in a regular cooler with, sitting on ice. Normally, this javelina would be sitting in my refrigerator for 18 to 21 days so that I get a good age on it. Any butcher is going to tell you if the meat's not aged, it's going to be tough and it's not gonna have the flavor you're looking for. Another thing you wanna get off of javelina is this fat. This fat right here has a very sour taste to it and you don't want that stuff. So we need to get that off there. We might lose a little meat doing this, but with a good knife like this one, it's coming off nice and easy. So I was asking Steven earlier if this is why people think that javelina tastes gross and uh, he think he agrees that most people probably just don't know how to process it very well. So this if is you, a good learning experience. If you take it to a, proce a professional processor, they're going to process it like they do everything else. They're going to take the meat. If you want to make chorizo or hamburger or, uh, or any other sausage out of it, they're going to grind it up the way it is. That's not the best way to do it because you leave all this stuff on there because they're not going to take the time to do it. It's not cost effective for them and you're gonna end up with something that's gonna have some bad flavors in it. In a lot of cases, I'm not gonna say all processors are that way, but in a lot of cases that way, simply because they don't have the time to do what I take the time to do. Let's get all the fat off and get as much of the silver skin off as you can before you start doing anything with it. Now, once I get it somewhat into a position where I can deal with it, see this silver, this tendon, is going underneath another muscle, so you can't really mess with that right now. I like to take it and I start breaking down individual muscles and turning those into steaks. Other parts of it I can turn into um, tidbits, what I, I call tidbits, they're, they're great for stews, um, hashes, stuff like that. But I like to grab an individual muscle like this one right here and I can cut this in, up into steaks and it comes out very well. You just have to make sure that you get it off the bone without your finger going with it. One thing about beef, one thing about beef that's why they grain feed beef to get the taste in the fat when you cook it. Okay. <clears throat> that meat will taste what he eats. Right. Unless you age it. Okay. So the aging helps with the flavor. Oh, oh. It, the it, enzymes in the meat, meat is what makes it tender. Okay. The aging down the is protein. what makes it have its flavor. Oh, wow. Okay. See, I learned that going through refrigeration school. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge in this little household here. 
it's pretty cool to see all this. See, like I said, I'm going after one individual muscle at a time. And here it is. You can take this right now, take a little bit of the silver skin off and just slice it up and turn it into small medallion steaks. Cook them right on the grill, pan fry them. They're gonna be tender. I've never had javelina or deer aged the way we do it that I couldn't cut it with a fork. Wow. And I'm talking a regular dinner fork. I'm not talking anything fancy. It will meet the same way. I've cut many a steak from an elk with a fork. <laughs> I'm now, just realizing that knife is ABL, not 3V, so that's not even the best stuff. It's good steel though. Oh yeah, it's cutting nicely. It's not dragging. Now, if any of you all hunters out there watch Steve Ranella. Yeah, man, meat eater. Yes, the meat eater. This man knows his stuff. If he can go hunt black bears where there's a lot of wild blueberries and he takes that fat and renders it down, what does he say the fat tastes like? Blueberries. The fat tastes like blueberries because that is where the nasty flavors are from or the good flavors depending on what they're eating. That's why he goes after the bears that are at the blueberry the blueberry fields up there. And some of these muscles intertwine with each other and to make things a little bit difficult, you just have to pick your spot where you're just gonna take it and whack it off like that. Don't need that in there. So that's that silver skin you're pulling off? Yeah, and you can see here, there is a thorn from him busting through brush and stuff. You need to get that stuff out unless you want to chew on it. I don't know how well you can see that. You can see it pretty good. Thanks so it's to just, the new iPhone 11. <laughs> you gotta get that stuff out of there. Sometimes this stuff just does not want to come off. And in some cases you just have to live with it. But there are some sections that you can get most of that off. Getting that thorn out right now. There it is. I mean, we need fiber in our diet, but not that bad. <laughs> Again, I'm going after a little bit of fat right here. There are, like I said, cases where you're gonna lose a little bit of meat. You have to sacrifice a little bit of meat in order to get a better cut overall. Like this right here is gonna have to go. You see, here's a little bit of fat right here we need to get rid of. Well, typically when I butcher an animal up like this, I don't cut individual steaks at this point because I'm going to vacuum seal the meat. When you vacuum seal and you've got a whole bunch of individual cuts inside the pouch, it lends to having some air pockets in there, which promotes freezer burn. And again, bad tasting meat. So you need to not cut everything up fully when you're doing initial butcher like this. I wait until I'm ready to take that piece of meat out of the freezer and I'm getting ready to cook it up. Then I cut individual steaks. I cut it into cubes if I'm gonna make a, a stew or a, something like a, a little batch of chunk of meat that I could make into, well, let's see, I did chili last week, cut up some, some deer meat that I had, I made a uh, fresh chili out of it that came out freaking fantastic. Other than a little bit of tendon right here, that once I cut this up, this chunk here, again, you can cut it up into steaks. You want to cut across the grain, not with the grain. Um, make little little steaks out of it, or you can cut it up into chunks and, and make a stew or a, a, a chili or something like that. If at that point, I'll come back in, I'll take this piece off, and I'll take this tendon up because this is also very tough. This boy's got a lot of fat in him. I think. Ever wonder why when you do a deer, a deer, the smell when you gut it out, 
that smell disappears after four days of being refrigerated. Really? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> wow. It disappears. That's really cool. And that's a sign that the enzymes in the meat is doing this job. Wow. Breaking down the protein. See another thorn in there. Yep. See, there's, there's a lot of science to how this works. You talk to any chef and he will tell you the science of how the enzymes and the protein chains in meat are and what you have to do to create a tender piece of meat. And it's all because of science. It's nothing to do with, well, I've done this for years. I've learned it this way. No, there's science behind all of this. And if you don't understand science, you better pay attention to what somebody else is doing and learn how he's doing it and not really questioning why he's doing it. Just pay attention to what he's doing. It's one of the things I learned when I became a medic is I learned how muscles are. I've learned anatomy. I mean, a good butcher is going to understand anatomy. It's another good chunk. I tended to make chunks into roughly a pound, unless it's a, a specific muscle. I'll keep the muscle whole. But typically I run a pound of meat per package. That way I have it portioned out. I don't have to guess how much. So if I've got a specific recipe I'm going after, or I'm feeding a certain amount of people, I can grab four packages and I know I've got a roughly four pounds of meat because that's about what I'm gonna need to feed, say, 15 people. It's just simple math that way. Ten minutes of prep here saves you two hours of prep down the road. See this? Separation of one muscle layer with another. We'll put this in a package by itself. I'll call it tidbits, like I said before. And that's pretty much as simple as it is for breaking down one ham leg on a javelina. Now, obviously with deer, you're gonna deal with bigger muscles, have better steaks, but I tell everybody on my pages, my Facebook pages that say javelina isn't good for anything but burritos or chorizo, and I tell, I tell them they're full of it. A prime example of that is I took some javelina meat that I aged in a refrigerator for 14 days and I took it right alongside some javelina meat that I aged for 21 days and I fed it to a couple of guys that have never had javelina and I cooked it on the grill right next to a mule deer and they couldn't tell me the difference. Now, naturally, because I've been doing this for eons now, I can tell the difference. I could tell the difference between a 14-day aged piece of meat and a 21-day aged piece of meat. 21 days is um, beef. Yep. 21 days in a, in a controlled environment, wrapped in a, in a sheet, wet down, 21 days, at 36 degrees and 50% humidity. That is what they do beef. If, if you want good beef. If you want good beef. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to have either no taste or it's going to be on the tough side. That is that is typically what you get at Safeway and Fry's, places like that, those standard butcher shops or grocery stores. A minimum 21 days is what they stand before they start butchering up a side of beef. Your really good um, steakhouses, other places that really pay attention to their meat are going to be aged a lot longer than 21 days. 
like I was explaining to Kevin here, there's a steakhouse in <clears throat> New York City that does dry and wet aged processing for their steaks. And their minimum is for 45 days. And I've had that 45 day aged steak and it's $100 a plate for a, I think it was a, either 16 or 18 ounce porterhouse. But that thing melted in my mouth. I'll tell you, that was the best steak I've ever had. And I don't think I'm going to find anything better than that, except for maybe some elk steaks. There's another chunk. Now we can take all these, what I call leftover pieces, because they're not really much of a muscle mass to it. There's a lot of fat, sinew, tendon, that you're gonna find in some of these pieces, especially the front legs. And those are typically ground up into hamburger, chorizo, sausage, um, cut into tidbits for stews and chilies like I do. I don't do a lot on the chorizo or sausage unless I've got an elk. Cause to me, it's not worth the hassle for three or four pounds of sausage. If I'm gonna do it, it's gonna be with an elk, and I'm gonna have, when I get done, 10 or 15 pounds of chorizo, 15 pounds or so of summer sausage, breakfast sausage is another 20 pounds, 30 pounds of hamburger. Cause then it's worth breaking out the grinder and doing all that extra work. Sometimes these pieces are just a pain in the butt. got to get that fat even a little bit of fat like that can make a drastic difference in the in the flavor of wild game now you got a lot of customers of yours and, I'm, and I've got a few customers that are back east hunters eastern whitetail do not feed on scrub they don't feed on mesquite beans they don't feed on manzanita they don't feed on um, brow cactus fruit, prickly pear fruit. These animals out here do. So they're going to try and carry over those flavors. Sometimes those flavors aren't very nice. <laughs> Eastern whitetail eat corn fields, um, a lot of soybean fields, <clears throat> or if you're like some of the guys out there and you're putting out little plots food plots for deer that are designed specifically to feed deer the aging process is a lot less intensive because the flavors of what they're eating that gets transferred into the meat isn't as bad so you don't have to worry about it but out here <laughs> they eat everything that you would not expect them to eat especially javelina i mean these guys are digging up roots and tubers out of the ground the one thing that i have found heavily to eat that isn't bad is the wild onions that are out here hmm. and these wild onions really don't have much of a, a serious onion flavor like a like a yellow onion they're more of a, a red or a, a vidalia onion with the sweetness that they have and i've dug them up and i've actually tasted them i wanted to see i want to know what these animals are eating I can prepare my food based off of that too. This piece here is going to be more fight than it's worth. It's got multiple tendons in it. You can see that it's covered in cactus. To me, this section right here is just not worth it. It's dog food. Half the dogs want it. He knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah, he does. He's doing a good job. They learned a lot from me when I went through refrigeration school about how you manage meat. I bet. Be because if you're going to do refrigeration, you got to know. If you get involved in that part of the industry, you got to know what you need to do or what the unit needs to do mm -hmm. to make the meat like, it's, like you want it to be. Yeah, of course. If you can't do it, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Working on a tenderloin? 
Mm, back strap. Back strap. All right. Shows you how much I know about he's muscles. Doing, it's coming from. Okay. Need to get this a little bit wet. Now this piece, some people are gonna cry about. I don't care. I know better. You can see there's just a little bit of mold starting on this edge. This outside edge that you don't eat, you don't have to worry about it. There's nothing wrong with the meat. I've seen so many people, oh my God, it's got mold and I'll throw it away. No, pay attention. This is like cheese. Cut the moldy section off. You're good. <laughs> I definitely save cheese that way. I don't oh. throw away cheese at all. No. Cheese is one of the main food groups of my house. Skin it off <laughs> and keep going. Okay. Now, this is the back strap. This is the, the muscle that runs along the spine above the rib cage, uh, at the top of the rib cage. All this right here needs to go, unless you like chewing on leather. <laughs> now for this, a better tool than this knife would be an actual fillet knife. Yeah. But I wanna see how this knife does. It seems to be working quite well so far, but you do have to work it a little bit, get it underneath this tendon. And that's really what this is. Some people call it silver skin. This is not silver skin, this is actually tendon. Not doing too bad. Yeah, there's one over on the table. Yeah, I don't want yeah. to destroy this. We need a long, a long bendy knife. There we go. Yep. Just a little bit, but no big deal. I've also watched people butcher animals that don't know what they're doing. And I say they don't know what they're doing. I've been doing this since I was old enough to hold a knife. If there was an animal hanging in this backyard, it didn't matter who shot it. We were all out here doing this. This is what you call a family affair. And I've watched people take fillet knives and just go to town on whatever they're doing. They're real, what I call mean with it. You don't need to be mean. A light touch is all you really need. You don't need to just rip through it. There you go. Beautiful. Now you gonna make a big video for the, all this? Oh aren't yeah, you? that's what I'm doing right now. I know, but I'm saying yeah. you're gonna publish. It. Oh yeah, it'll be on YouTube. <laughs> There's. We're gonna put in some nice screens and stuff before it. There's a dozen or so little medallions right there. It's the tenderest part of the animal, right there. Oh, it's my favorite. So how long did you say it's been aging in this cooler? This cooler sitting on blocks, 10 pound blocks of ice has been, actually it might be more than 10 days. I know it is. This and might what, be right where I want it. What do you think the average temperature is in that cooler? It's about 33 degrees. 33 degrees? 33 to 36, depending on the outside temperature heating it up. Right, it's been nice and cool, that's good. Right. I've, I've only had to add blocks of ice to that once. Oh, wow. Since I got oh. it. That cooler he's got there is one of the better ones. Yeah. For, you know, for retaining the coldness and retaining the ice. Yeah. Of course, the meat at the top is not going to be as cold as the meat directly on the ice. Right. So you got an average in there. Right. Of temperature on the meat. Right. Which is not bad. It's better than... Uh, an average refrigerator running around 40 degrees. Yep. Most people well, were on their refrigerator around 40, 42 degrees. Hell, you meet your uh, <clears throat> your milk won't last long. No. 
I can run I can run milk in my refrigerator refrigerator at least ten days past the date. Yeah. And it's still good. Yeah. Because it's so damn cold. Yeah. I keep mine on the coldest setting too. In fact, there's spots in my refrigerator, it'll freeze. Yeah. yeah. I so bet. now you know how cold it's <laughs> <been. laughs> It's not running around 40, 42 no. degrees. No. I've reached in for the tub of sour cream to put on some some chili or to put on something else and it's frozen. I'm like, <laughs> That costs you a little bit more money to run it electricity wise, yeah. but the thing is well, you save money on food. It's yep. what you want to do in keeping your food yep. edible. Food costs a lot more than that. Damn right it does. Especially now. If you want fresh food. Yeah, if you want fresh food. I've got uh, a couple of pork chops in there now, and I'll bet you a dollar it's frozen. <laughs> now, a lot of people say that another animal that we have in this state is not edible, and that is a jackrabbit. Matter of fact, I think next weekend my son and I are gonna go pop a few. <clears throat> hey, that sounds fun. Cause where we were pig hunting, they are freaking everywhere. So I think I'm gonna go thin the herd a little bit. <laughs> you know what you can do? You can take quail, rabbit, and squirrel. And I've done this. Put it in the refrigerator in a plastic bag with no water and leave it there. And it comes out tasting totally different. Really? Yeah. Even though quail is nice and tender, but the squirrel and the rabbit aren't that tender. But it becomes that tender when you leave it there long enough. Wow. I'll take a rabbit and I'll butcher him up the way I want. And with the size of the jackrabbits that we have out here, I've got back straps like this coming off rabbits. Wow. And I'll take that meat and I'll stick it in the refrigerator in a Ziploc bag and I'll get as much air out of it as I can because air does not work well with meat in a in certain settings, I should say. It's it's necessary in, in a lot of others, but with small game, I don't like a lot of air. And I'll have that animal in the refrigerator in a Ziploc bag for anywhere from 8 to 12 days. And I'll take him out and I'll pan fry him up. And you will not think that that is a jackrabbit backstrap when I get done cooking it. Biggest jackrabbits I've ever, I've ever seen were in, in Lackland Air Force Base where we did our training. Them things look <laughs> like dogs, man. Oh, you was down there too. Yeah, man. yeah. They look like dogs. <laughs> That's where I spent my training days. It's huge rabbits. The antelope jackrabbits, the one I'm referring to down south, they, they'll stand, if their ears are up, they'll be waist high. Holy. Yeah. You pick it up, you got about eight pounds, nine pounds of rabbit. Yeah. Well, did you ever have a group of guys on the rifle range turn on a rabbit that ran across the range? Trying, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't Trying like there. hell. You want to know something that happened? Maybe I shouldn't say this on film. Oh, well. So we were in England. <clears throat> And we had the targets set up for the 60 and the 249. Mm -hmm. And so they're the big long targets and you know, they stand like this tall, but they're really long. So we couldn't see anything behind them. So we get done shooting all day and um, we go out there to take the targets down and pack everything up. And uh, behind it was a whole bunch of dead sheep. that were just standing right behind the target, yeah. So, not only did the Air Force have to pay for the sheep, but they had to pay for, like, X amount of generations mm -hmm. after that. It's, it's a big deal in England if you accidentally kill one of their livestock. It's, yeah. it's a much bigger deal than here. 